Um, uh, several of our families are still going through it, and praise God, uh, he is faithful in seeing people uh, through, uh, but we just appreciate your prayers for our church body and for our community. All right, this morning we will be in Genesis chapters 9 through 13. 9 through 13. As many of you know by now, we have started a new study through the book of Genesis, and we're taking a survey approach, so we're taking several chapters at a time, and if you want to catch up on past studies, you can find them on our YouTube channel. They're there for you. Let me just get set here. You know, I don't think Jesus ever had to worry about getting his tablet to work when he taught the multitudes. Modern troubles, modern troubles. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. God, we pray and ask that you would speak to us. God, that you would open up our eyes to your blessings. Father, you would open up our eyes to what it is uh, to walk in faith as Abraham did. God, we pray you would direct our hearts and you would encourage and strengthen our faith through your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're jumping right into Genesis chapter 9. We've just read about Noah and the flood and God being faithful to those in the ark and them coming out of the ark and then worshiping God there at the end of chapter 8. Chapter 9. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And I want to stop right here at the first verse and just talk for a moment about this idea of blessing because it says here that God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. We love this word blessed as Christians. Oh, I'm blessed. Be blessed. Are you blessed? I mean, this is... You know, this is one of our, this is maybe the central word in our Christianese jargon. Uh, in the South, of course, we love this word. We say, oh, bless his heart, which is like the most polite put down ever. Um, it really means you poor befuddled fool. But, uh, <laughs> but, but this idea of blessing, what is it to really be blessed or to have God's blessing? You know, so far in the text, um, we've seen that... God has blessed Adam and Eve. He said, the text says that he blessed them and told them to go out and multiply. Uh, we've read so far in the text that God blessed actually the sea creatures and the birds in creation and told them to go out and multiply. Uh, we saw that God blessed the seventh day in the act of creation. He set it apart as a special day, a day of rest for man and to commemorate his work of creation, that it was complete. And so, in all of this, we can surmise just by how the word is used, that when we're talking about blessing, you know, sometimes we think about blessing as just some sort of Christian magic pixie dust, and oh, if I had some of that, my life would be better. But what is blessing really? Well, looking at all these uses of the word, we find out that God's blessing what we might call his approval and his enablement, it's always connected to his purposes. God wanted the animals to multiply and fill the earth, so he blessed them. God set aside the seventh day for a special purpose, and so he blessed it. God wanted Adam and Eve to go out and multiply and fill the earth, and he blessed them. Blessing is always connected to God's purposes. And I bring this out to say that if we truly want to be blessed people, if you want to have a blessed marriage, if you want to have a blessed family, if you want your business or your work to be blessed, really the thing for us to do is then to align these areas of our life with whatever God's purpose is. And then we're going to know his blessing. When we can align our marriage with God's purpose. We can align our family with God's purpose. We can align our work 
with God's purpose. You're like, well, how do I do that? My family's a nutcase, you know? <laughs> how do I do that? My work is crazy. How, how, do I, how do I take these chaotic areas of my life and, and align them with God's purpose? Well, the very first thing that you do is that you begin to do marriage or family or work or whatever the area of life is, just begin to do it God's way. You just follow his purpose for you in those things. And you begin to align yourself with God's way of doing things. And guess what's going to happen? You're going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed. This is what the Lord does. He blesses those who align themselves with his purposes. And so we see that here, that God blesses those who come out of the ark and gives them again that command to go out into the world and to fill it and to multiply. Then the next thing that God does is he's going to uh, really establish for them or explain to them what their relationship is uh, to the created world in this new environment after the flood. It says here in verse 2, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth, and on all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. So man had been given dominion at creation over the created world, over the animal life, um, but it's, it's not always now going to be a friendly relationship. God put the fear of man into the animal kingdom. And so man would still have dominion, but it's going to be a different kind of relationship. Verse 3, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you, God says. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. Remember, God said you can eat of all the green herbs, of all the plant life. Now God approves and blesses that man can be an omnivore and man can eat meat. Praise God. Right? And, um, uh, you, but there's a restriction here in verse 4. He says, you shall not eat flesh with its life. That is the blood. So you can eat meat. You can eat animal meat, right? But, but God says, don't eat the blood. Um, and so this is going to be a huge benefit to man as he moves out into the world, into a world where the environment is going to be changing. Um, crops are not going to be as easy to grow. You're going to have winter seasons now. And so the, the ability, the blessing to, to be an omnivore is going to help sustain man. But this important restriction about not eating the blood God wants them to respect this. Now look at verse 5. He says, Surely your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast. I will require it from the hand of man. From the hand of every man's brother I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. We've already been through Genesis um, uh, chapters 3 and 4 there, and we've seen the sin of Cain killing his brother Abel. But here God declares that the life is in the blood. You should respect the blood, and you shouldn't shed blood, and then in that you shouldn't commit murder. God prohibited the act of murder. And, they, and the language here is distinct in the Hebrew. There's a difference between murder and killing. Murder being the premeditated taking of another person's life out of uh, anger or vengeance or um, uh, contrary from any sort of punishment. But notice that God does lay out what the punishment is for murder, that, a, that man's life should be taken. If man takes a life, his life should be taken by man. Now, we see this codified more specifically later in the Mosaic Law, when God speaks uh, to his people. And we see this come up in two different ways. If a man killed someone, he could run accidentally. If he killed someone accidentally, he could run and escape to what is called a city of refuge. Now, the idea here is that there would be an avenger. See, the normal process was if someone was killed, then someone from his family would be responsible to exact justice against the one who committed the killing, presumably the murder. 
So if you accidentally killed someone and, and someone from his, their family came after you, you could run to the city of refuge and you would be protected there until the city elders could hold a court and judge your case and find out if you were innocent or not. So there was protection built into the law for accidental killing. But we also know that the law says that if uh, you commit murder, right, what is the punishment? Well, it would be stoning. It would be capital punishment. And so that gets instituted in its most early form right here after the flood. And so in this, we really see the beginnings of God establishing human government. And that's really the role of human government is in the eyes of God and in the plan of God, the role of human government is to keep justice, is to keep order. This gets very explicit in the New Testament in Romans 13, where Paul says that the authority is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, you should be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he, that is the government authority, is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. And so we see the groundwork for this laid in the book of Genesis, that God establishes human government to keep justice. And we all know that when the government does keep justice, things are generally good, societies prosper. But when there's injustice, when there's lots of corruption, right, life is miserable. So uh, we, we just see that though laid out here for us already in Genesis chapter nine. Now look at verse seven. It says, as for you, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, and as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. So God promised never to destroy the world again by a great flood. Now, we've already talked about how there's this connection between the judgment of the world in Noah's flood and the coming judgment, the final judgment, and the return of Christ, of the ungodly. And uh, we know that that judgment will not be by a flood. It will be by a fire, right? But God set this sign, this rainbow. He said, whenever you see the rainbow, just remember my promise that I'm going to, I'm going to, allow the earth to continue, and I'm going to allow life to continue and not destroy the world with a flood again. Verse 18, now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth, Japheth took a garment, laid it on their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. Now, the phrase here in verse 22, saw the nakedness of his father and told his brothers, is a little bit cryptic for us. We don't understand exactly what transpired here. The language does indicate that when Ham went outside and told his two brothers about their father, that he did it in a very kind of mocking way. And we don't know if more than that happened, that he was just mocking his father, ridiculing him. Um, 
there could have been some sort of sexual abuse or other incident that happened. Um, but it seems plain in whatever regard, Ham was trying to publicly humiliate his father. And Noah's reaction to this is very severe. Look at chapter 9, 24. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew that his younger son knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. So, suffice it to say, nothing good happens when you're drunk. It didn't for Noah and his family. But in response to this, Noah makes this pronouncement, and it sounds to us like a pronouncement of judgment, not directly against his son Ham, but against Ham's descendants, specifically those of his grandson Canaan. And whatever happened here, when Noah responds, God uses this opportunity to give a prophetic announcement that the sons of Canaan, which will become the Canaanites, who will live and populate uh, the area, live in and populate the area we now know as Israel, that eventually Seth's descendants would overtake them. And we know this is exactly what happened when Joshua comes into the promised land, the land that we'll see God will promise to Abraham in just a, a few verses. And so this is a prophetic announcement that the descendants of Seth, specifically through Abraham, will conquer the descendants of Canaan. Now look at verse 28. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. So all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So in the rest of Scripture, we get this picture of Noah's life, right? And now in the rest of Scripture, Noah is remembered as an incredibly faithful man toward God, a giant of faith, really. Um, Ezekiel puts Noah in the same category as Job and Daniel, two other giants of faith in Scripture. Uh, Noah is mentioned, of course, in Hebrews 11, what we call the Hall of Faith, as a man of great standing before God, a righteous man, a faithful man. And it's so awesome to me that in all of Scripture, where Noah is mentioned and remembered, it never once talks about Noah getting drunk and having this family problem. And I just, I just think that's such a, a great little synopsis or encapsulation of how God sees us. That, you know, we're not righteous on our own. We're not righteous because of what we've done. We're righteous because of faith. And when the Lord looks back on our life, you know what he sees? He sees the righteousness of Jesus. And he's not pulling up all the, oh, you blew it there. You remember that one time? Do you remember that dumb decision that you made? Do you remember when you knew what was right and you did what was wrong anyway? So, see, God doesn't do that. He, he's not ticking off the sins of the past. Isn't that an amazing expression of the grace of God towards his people and his love that he looks back and he doesn't see all those faults, but he sees who we are in Christ Jesus. The record the official record going forward for Noah is perfect. That's the righteousness of Jesus. That's how the Lord sees his saints. All right, chapter 10. Now, as we get into chapter 10, I want to just start with a quote uh, from uh, a man by the name of William F. Albright. In the last century, William F. Albright was a renowned scholar, a Bible scholar, a renowned archaeologist. He participated and led many excavations uh, in the Middle East. And this is what he says. He says, The tenth chapter of Genesis stands absolutely alone in ancient literature without a remote parallel, even among the Greeks, where we find the closest approach to a distribution of people in genealogical framework. We call chapter 10 here the table of nations. 
And he says, the table of nations remains an astonishingly accurate document. Well, we're not going to read all of chapter 10 because I don't want to make you suffer while I try to pronounce all these names. But the genealogy that's given to us in Genesis chapter 10 lays out for us the basic distribution of people groups in the world after the flood based on Noah's three sons. And so I want to do I do want to give you just a few highlights. Look at verse 1. It says, Now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and sons were born to them after the flood. Now when, we, when you go through and read this chapter, there are links between many of these names and distinct regions and places in the world. Okay? And... Um, uh, you'll, you will probably recognize some if you just read through it casually on your own, if you're familiar with your Bible. But uh, historians and linguists have no trouble matching up these names with distinct peoples and places. And they can see the connections here. And it's very accurate. Verse 2, it says, The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. These are people groups that settled uh, mostly across Europe, from Europe, you know, uh, all the way to the west into the areas of Russia. And so later on, when you read prophecies about Gog and Magog and these people groups up in the north, we know that refers uh, to Russian people. Verse 6, the sons of Ham, I'm skipping down now. Verse 6, the sons of Ham were Cush, Mirazim, Put, and Canaan. There's Canaan again. The sons of Ham settled... Uh, areas mostly of the African continent, but also some areas of the Middle East. As we talked about, Canaan would settle what we know as the modern land of Israel. Verse 8, Cush. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. I used to work for a hunting magazine. And uh, I did some digging in the archives from issues way back, and I say way back. Some of you will, will look at me not kindly if I say this, but way back in the 1960s and 70s. And um, uh, it was popular in that generation for hunters to refer to themselves as Nimrods, the mighty Nimrod, Nimrod, the mighty hunter. And I, I saw this reference all over the place in, in these past magazines. Um, but that notion that Nimrod was a mighty hunter and that he was a hunter of game or of animals is not really accurate. The, the context of the passage makes it clear that Nimrod was a mighty hunter, but he was a hunter of men. He was a warrior. He was a military leader. And the idea of uh, being a hunter before the Lord is not like he was in the Lord's service, but it was actually against the Lord. Um, Nimrod here is mentioned, uh, his settlements, the first being Babel. So when we read of uh, the Tower of Babel in the next chapter, Nimrod is the founder of that kingdom or that empire in rebellion against God. All right, verse 21. And children were born to Shem, the father of the children, uh, of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder. And so we get Shem's line here now articulated for us, past verse 21. Shem's descendants, of course, include the Hebrews um, and the people groups also that settled Asia Minor, that would be modern Turkey, and also over toward Babylon and what we call Persia and, and all of that area, the Middle East. And so now, verse 29, uh, we get mentions of specific uh, descendants in the Shem line, Ophir, Havila and Jobab, and I just point out Jobab to say that many scholars believe Jobab is the Job that we read of in the Bible. He lived in the age of the patriarchs. All right, verse 32, all the way at the end. These were the families of the sons of Noah according to their generations in their nations, and from these nations were divided on the earth after the flood. Chapter 11. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. Now, Shinar is just another name for the area of Babylon, okay? Um, and they dwelt there. 
verse 3. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make for ourselves, let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, like the flood stories that we've talked about that come from every corner of the globe and in every culture, uh, we also see scattered across the world um, pyramid-shaped mounds, right? We have, we, we have the big pyramids in Egypt. We know there are pyramids that the Aztecs built uh, in what we call the New World in Central America, and, and, and we know they, they have pyramid-shaped mounds um, in, uh, in the Far East and in the Asian cultures, and we just see these worldwide. And uh, I don't want to bust your bubble, but these are not the products of alien technology, contrary to some very popular TV shows, right? But they are evidence of a common origin for civilization. And it would seem that the Tower of Babel that we just read about here in Genesis 11 is the prototype. This is the first great tower. And what is it about? Notice in verse 4, it says that they did not want to be scattered they did not want to be scattered. Remember that God's command back to them in chapter 9 was that they were to disperse and to fill the earth, to multiply and fill the earth. And here they're like, we don't want to do that. We want to stay in one location. We want to be united together as one people. Um, it says also that they wanted to create a lasting name or legacy for themselves, make ourselves a name. It, you know, in that description that we read of the tower and how they built it, they made bricks out of mud, and they covered them with asphalt or, or, or a petroleum kind of pitch. All these materials are readily found in uh, the area that's described. But this gives us the idea that they were building a tower, and they were making it waterproof. Right? It would be tall as to the heavens. Right? They're building this thing to withstand, potentially, another judgment from God. Another flood, to be high, up into the heavens, the highest thing, and to be able to withstand the floodwaters. It's like they were saying, you know what? God's not going to wipe us out again. Now, finally, we know from history that there's a strong connection between the building of these pyramid structures and pagan worship, specifically forms of worship based on astrology, right? Right? And so when you put all this together, it's like, wow, here are these people united in their efforts to build their own kingdom, to do their own thing, and to worship not the creator, but his creation. You know, it seems that God's command to scatter and to multiply was not just for the good of the earth. You ever think about this? It was also for the good of the people. You see, God understood that if they were united, sin, would, their sinful nature would just increase and feed on itself and bloom and blossom that much faster. And so God's command, I want you to scatter, was not only for the good of the earth, I think it was for the good of the people. That, that, that they wouldn't organize themselves in rebellion. But, but man is stubborn. A man likes to do his own thing. And so here they, they begin to build. And let's see what the result is. Look at verse 5. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased the building, they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Interestingly enough, in our last chapter in that genealogy, we skipped over the name of a man named Peleg. And it says there in the last chapter that in his days, the earth was divided. 
And it seems to us that's a notation that it was in his generation the Tower of Babel was built and that the population of the earth was divided. Men were divided across the earth. But God confused their languages. And um, just a little note here, modern linguists have no universally accepted theory about how language developed. The really smart people who study language today don't agree on how humans developed language because it's a phenomenally, language is a phenomenally complex system. But for it to work, it has to be a complete and finished system. And, and it just baffles us how something complete and, and, and so complex could develop over time. The one thing that many linguists do agree upon is that studying the nature of languages, it appears that all languages come from a common source. Right? So that's baffling to them. But it's not that baffling if you just read the book of Genesis. Because God created language. He gave us the ability to communicate, and he created languages. Right? <laughs> they do have one source. It's the creator. Uh, but God used language to scatter the people. Second thing before we move on is we're talking about the Tower of Babel and Nimrod and the establishment of this kingdom and then God scattering people. Babel will become what we know as Babylon, right? It is the ancient center, really, of man's first kingdom. It's an organized rebellion of humanity against the order and kingdom of God. And throughout Scripture, Babylon becomes indicative of the world system. In its later form, God will use Babylon to judge Israel, take them captive, right? It will be the home of Daniel the prophet. It will be the first of the world kingdoms in Daniel's prophecies. And in the book of Revelation, the world economic system and the world's religious system in worshiping the Antichrist are referred to as Babylon. And both are judged, Look, the rebellious nature of man always desires its own way contrary to God's way. And there will be another Nimrod called the Antichrist. And there will be another Babylon, but both will be judged. There is nothing new under the sun. History, definitely, and humanity repeats itself, right? All right, following this description of Babylon, we have uh, an extended genealogy here, and we get more detail on the descendants of Shem, which is the godly line through which the Messiah will come. All right. Now I said it, Peleg showed up in the last chapter. I, was, I misspoke. Peleg shows up in this chapter uh, down here in verse 16. But look at verse uh, 16. It says, Eber lived 34 years and begot Peleg. Um, the other thing that I want to just mention to you about Peleg and his generation is that those who take a young earth view, a literal view of creation out of Scripture, uh, from the time of Babylon to the time of Abraham is when we would see the earth going through what, uh, what we call an ice age, right? Um, we can imagine incredible volcanic activity happening at the flood. The scriptures talk about the deep being broken up, waters coming out of the ground. Uh, <clears throat> it would make sense, and we have geologic evidence of this, that that volcanic activity continued for a good span of time after the flood. And when you have a lot of volcanic activity and you have a lot of material in the atmosphere that reflects the sun's radiation, you get a cooling effect. And when you have cool air and warm oceans, especially if those oceans have just been warmed by water coming out of the earth, you get what is essentially lake effect snow. Warm water, cool air, the water evaporates quickly, it goes into the atmosphere, it comes back as snow. And so you have a cooling effect 
around the globe and you quickly have an ice age. You have glaciers starting to cover much of the northern hemisphere. And so when we go back in archaeology and our geologic studies, we see evidence of this, right? At this time, there will be so much ice, the oceans would have lowered. Actually, the English Channel would be dry. The Bering Strait would be dry. Um, the Persian Gulf wouldn't even exist. And we have evidence of, um, of all of this. Uh, and what we've referred to as Neanderthal man and Cro-Magnon man and cave people and their dispersions, that would be this period in biblical history where people are scattered to go out, but they're finding very harsh conditions. These are not agrarian societies where they get to farm and create plantations and all of this. They're, they're struggling to live. And um, yet man does populate the earth, right? We can look at genetics and see where different people groups come from that live around the globe now and the patterns that they must have followed in their travels. And that all fits with the biblical account. But by the time we get to uh, the end of this genealogy, to a man named Terah and his sons, which will include Abraham, uh, it seems that the earth has... Uh, the geologically calmed down and warmed up and things are starting to approach uh, an environment and an atmosphere that uh, we would be much more familiar with today. All right, let's get down to verse 26. It says, Now Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And this is the genealogy of Terah. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I just threw me. Now, Terah lived, verse 26, Now, Terah lived seven years, and we got Abram, Nahor, and Haram. Abram, of course, is the man who will become known as Abraham, and I apologize, but when I talk about Abram and Abraham, I'm just going to use those names interchangeably. Um, verse 27, This is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begot Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in, the native, in his native land, in Ur of the Chaldeans. That would be down in the area of Babylon. Then Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. She will become Sarah. And the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was, bo was barren, and she had no child. So Sarah, or Sarai, Abram's wife, uh, uh, will indeed have a child, right? That's the big reveal later in the story. But it notes here that she was barren. Verse 31. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife. They went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So we find out that Abram or Abraham and his father and his nephew and their wives, they all leave their hometown of Ur, far south in Babylon. They, try, they travel basically 600 miles up the Euphrates River. They just follow that track up the river to the city of Haran. And they stay there, and then Abram's father dies, Okay. Why did they do this? Well, we get the background for this in the next chapter. Look at 12. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him, and Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Okay, in the book of Acts, chapter 7, where Stephen gives an address before the religious rulers in Jerusalem and confronts them about Jesus, he gives a history of the nation of Israel as part of his message. And in this message, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Stephen talks about Abraham. And this is what he says. He says, Brethren and fathers, listen. 
the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran, and said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and go to a land that I will show you. So we know from that that God first spoke to Abraham while he was in Ur, while he was in Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, down there on the Euphrates. God first spoke to him there and said, go to a land that I will show you. And so Abraham traveled then and went to Haran, and he took Lot, his nephew, and his father with him. In Haran, up at the very sort of top of their route, Haran dies. And then God repeats his command to Abraham, and that's what we just read in 12, here in, in these first few verses. God says again, I want you to go to a land that I will show you, right? Depart. Now, what this tells us, and note also that in Joshua 24, when Joshua gives a speech to the nation of Israel, he references Abraham, and he says, don't forget, he says that Abraham and his family worshiped idols on the other side of the river, the other side of the Euphrates. This is where he starts to talk about, hey, we're going to serve the Lord, right? God's called us out of idol worship to serve him. But he uses Abraham as the first example. So when we put all this together, what we find out is God speaks to this man, Abraham, a descendant of Seth, because he wants to do something special with him. He wants to bless him. Remember we talked about blessing in the beginning of the message? God wants to bless him. He says, he says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Right? I just want us to realize that Abraham did not deserve God's blessing. Abraham was an idol worshiper in Babylon. And yet God sovereignly chose him and spoke to him and revealed himself to him. Why did God, because we all through the scriptures, like we should be like Abraham. We should have faith like Abraham. Abraham is, is legitimately called the father of faith. And he's an example to us. Hebrews says that Abraham, after hearing God, went forth not knowing where he was going. That's faith. When God says, I want you to do this, you're like, but I don't know how it's going to end up or where I'm going to end up, but I'm going to obey you anyway, God, because I trust you that you're good. That's faith. And Abraham did that in spades. Abraham, leave your family, leave your home, go to a land that I will show you. And he picked up all his possessions and he left. That's faith. But I want you to see that this incredible beginning of faith, and it is incredible, yet it's still not perfect. It's not perfect faith. And it's not like we have anything in the record that says that Abraham even deserved for God to do this. But God says, I'm going to bless you. Notice we can actually expand our definition of what blessing is. We said blessing was related to God's purposes, and blessing is really God enabling us to fulfill the purpose that he's given us, right? Right? Well, here, when God talks about blessing Abraham, he also says, uh, I'm going to protect you. I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. That's God's protection. So I think we can add that to our definition of what it is to be blessed by God. When we're blessed, God protects us and preserves us as we fulfill his purpose in our life, right? But then also, uh, it says here in the text uh, that you will be a blessing, Abraham, and you will be a blessing to all nations, and I think that means we can add to our definition of blessing that, that God also blesses us, not just for our own benefit, but he blesses us so we can bless other people. The blessing of God can be extended through us to others, right? And so this, is, this call of Abraham is an amazing act of God's grace to give him purpose, to put him in a direction God will make out of Abraham the nation of Israel through which the Messiah would come and all nations will be blessed. But Abraham is both unqualified and incapable of any of this on his own. 
He's a pagan idol worshiper. He's unqualified, and yet God still calls him. Why would God save me? Not because you're qualified, because he loves you. Right? And, and Abraham is incapable of becoming the father of God's people. Why? Because his wife can't have kids. She's barren. He is incapable of fulfilling the, God, the call that God puts in his life. And yet through God's blessings, he will both qualify Abraham and he will enable him to do what he's called to do. It's the same for us. God qualifies us by the blood of Jesus and by the work of the Holy Spirit, he enables us to be the people and fulfill the callings that he has for us. That's why Galatians 3 says this. It says, Know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. When Jesus was confronting the religious rulers of his day, they pushed back and said, oh, we're Abraham's sons. We're great with God. We're Abraham's children. And Jesus set them straight. And he said, you're not the sons of Abraham. If you were the sons of Abraham, you would do what Abraham did and believe in me. You would believe God. But when we do believe God, guess what? We all share in the blessings of Abraham. Pretty cool. That was my theological analysis. It's pretty cool. Look at verse 5. So Abraham took his wife and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. Now they're heading instead of northwest up to Haran. They leave the Euphrates River, and they come southwest down into what we, what we think of as Israel. And they come to the land of Canaan. Now, as I said, Abraham's beginnings in faith, and this is the amazing thing that we're going to watch. We're going to watch God build faith in Abraham's life. Abraham, the giant of faith, did not start out as the giant of faith. He had a great beginning and that he moved from his home, right? But he didn't have perfect obedience. Some believe that when he was in Haran, he was delaying going to the land of Canaan. Maybe, maybe not. But it does seem clear that Abraham brought along his family with him rather than making a clean break from his family as God indicated. God said, leave your home, go out from your family. And Abraham brings his father for part of the journey until his father passes away. And then he brings his nephew Lot with him. And when we look at the rest of the story, we find out Lot's gonna be a lot of trouble in Abraham's life, right? So Abraham has some amazing acts of obedience, yet he doesn't have perfect faith. He brings Lot along with him. But we're going to watch how God builds faith in Abraham. And it's the same for us. We should see ourselves in him. That is, if we're following God and we're walking by faith, that we're really going to identify with his, uh, prayerfully with his steps of obedience, but also with some of his shortcomings and his failures. But we're going to see how God is faithful despite those things, and then how God uses that to work in Abraham's heart. Look at verse 6. Abraham passed through the land of the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Morah, and the Canaanites were in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Shechem is right in the center of modern Israel. It's right in the promised land. He went right to the heart. And God said, okay, you're here. And Abraham worshiped the Lord there. And where he says, to your descendants, verse 7, I will give this land. It's literally the same word that's translated seed in Genesis chapter 3, where God promises through the seed of the woman, a savior would come. And here he says to Abraham, to your seed, 
I will give this land. Now, verse 8. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. That's just a little further south. And he pitched his tent with Bethel to the west and Ai to the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. So Abraham is in the promised land. Famine hits. It's very arid. And so he goes down to Egypt where they're going to have grain. Does this sound familiar about going to Egypt when there's a famine? This is going to come up again later in Genesis. Now he went down to Egypt. Verse 11, And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. Now, first of all, Sarah must have been incredibly beautiful. I don't know if there were like ancient beauty secrets of the East or whatever, <laughs> but just genetics, I guess. But, but Sarah apparently was absolutely beautiful. And Abraham anticipated that was, this was going to be a problem. We shouldn't think of Egypt quite like we think of Egypt in the days of Moses as this massive empire. But yet, is it an established place? And there is a ruler, and he has a harem, and Sarah would be very desirable for Pharaoh's harem. And so Abraham anticipates this, and he guilt trips his wife and says, you need to lie for me. You need to tell them that you're my sister. And, and technically, we read it, and I didn't stop on it, but uh, Sarah is Abraham's half-sister. So it's the half-truth, but that still makes it a whole lie. Right, And um, uh, we have to think here that either Abraham forgot God's promise, who said, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Either he forgot God's promise of protection, or he remembered it, but he just wasn't real sure, and he was uncomfortable. He just felt like he just needed to do a little something himself to hedge his bets. And so this is what he does. He gets Sarah to lie. Verse 14, so it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman that she was very beautiful. The, princess, the princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. You see, God didn't want Sarah to go into Pharaoh's harem or to be defiled by Pharaoh because God had a plan for Sarah. Sarah's womb was going to bring forth the child of promise who would be Isaac, from whom would come Jacob, from whom would come the nation of Israel, from whom would come the Messiah Jesus. And so God acted to protect Sarah, even though Abraham failed. He sent plagues. We don't know what the plagues were, but apparently they were sufficiently severe to get Pharaoh's attention. And through whatever method, he understood that they were from God and they were because of Sarai. And so Pharaoh called Abram and said, verse 18, what is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she was my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. All right, chapter 13. Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him to the south. And Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. Now this is amazing. Abram was rich man. And he had gotten richer in Egypt while he had his wife lie for him and gave a horrible testimony of his God and had to be rebuked by a pagan king. It's almost as if God blessed him just because he wanted to show his goodness, even when he didn't deserve it. Have you ever had God bless you when you know 
that you didn't deserve it? When you've even intentionally done something outside of his will, and yet in the consequences, he still brings about a protection for you and a blessing for you? I could raise my hand and, and probably get, and I could certainly give some testimonies how the Lord has taken care of me and my family when I know we didn't deserve it. But this is the goodness of God. This is one of the ways that God builds faith in his people. We become overwhelmed by his goodness to us when we know we don't deserve it. And then we stand and we say, how can I not trust him? How can I not trust him when he's this good to me? I also want to just point out, there are some amazing parallels here between Abraham and this experience in Egypt and the nation of Israel and their experience of Egypt that we'll read about later. Abraham and the nation of Israel both go down to Egypt because of a famine. Abraham and Israel are both endangered. Abraham and Israel both see God bring plagues against Pharaoh for his actions. And Abraham and Israel are both sent away with great wealth. It's a prophetic picture here for us of what God will do with the nation and his faithfulness to the nation in the years to come. Look at verse 3. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Lot also who went with Abram had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together for their possessions were so great that they should not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And the Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. So Abram said to Lot, Please, let there be no strife between you and me, between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. If you go to the right, then I will go to the left. I believe here we see the fruit of Abraham's Egypt experience. You see, when trouble comes with Lot, Abraham doesn't need to choose his own direction. He doesn't have to manipulate the situation. He doesn't have to manipulate Lot like he manipulated Sarah and Pharaoh. He just says simply, look, you choose. It's like he says, you choose because it doesn't matter because the Lord is going to take care of me. And he gives Lot freedom. And Lot, verse 10, lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, and it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go toward Zoar. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. We'll read more about Lot later, but we know that this is a poor choice on his part. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. You know, Lot just chose part of the land for himself, and God says, it's okay. I'm going to give it to your descendants. It's part of my promise to you. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could remember the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of uh, Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. God chooses a man and blesses him, and begins to work in him faith, a man who will become not just the father of faith, but a father of nations, a man whose blessings we get to share in by faith because of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we pray and ask, God, that you would give us a heart like Abraham, 
Lord, to respond to your call in our lives, that we would go forward, even if we don't know the destination, that we would go forward trusting you. And Lord, help us to trust you in each step. Lord, help us to grow in our faith. Lord, we are amazed at your goodness, and we thank you, Lord, for your grace toward us, that you love us and care for us and protect us. Lord, not for our sake, Lord, but even just for your sake, Lord, for your name's sake. And yet, Lord, we reap the benefits of your love and of your mercy and of your goodness. Lord, strengthen our faith, God, as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right.